Welcome to Daily News Analysis of Shankaray's Academy. Today's date is 17th September 2024. Today's topic of discussion is, first we have the Smart Precision Horticulture Program. This article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. We are going to discuss about the precision agriculture from the prelims perspective. The second news article is, how the emergency provisions is impacting the relationship between the center and state. So, this article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. We will discuss about the emergency provisions from the prelims perspective. And lastly, we have the government launches the startup registry. So, in this news article, we will see about the Bharat Startup Knowledge Access Registry from the prelims perspective. Look at this article from Hindu newspaper. It says, how do emergency provisions is impacting the relationship between the center and state government? So, this article highlights how the emergency provisions in the Indian constitution is affecting the relationship that is existing between the center government and the state government. So, on this backdrop, let us see about the emergency provisions from the prelims perspective detailly. So, the emergency provisions is given in the part 18 of the Indian constitution. So, we have three types of emergency, namely the national emergency, the state emergency and the financial emergency under Article 352, 356 and 360 respectively. Let us see one by one. First is the national emergency which is given under the Article 352. The national emergency is declared when the nation or the part of a country is under a security threat. So, the president will proclaim the national emergency on grounds of war, external aggression and the armed rebellion. So, these are the three grounds on which a national emergency will be declared in India. As already said, the president will declare the national emergency. So, he will declare this emergency on ground of these three. So, based on the written request from the cabinet, he will declare the emergency. So, we have prime minister, council of ministers and the parliament. So, the parliament has PM, council of minister and other MPs. So, the main ministers who are having important ministries form the cabinet. Based on the written request of these cabinet people, the president will proclaim the emergency. So, this has to be approved by the parliament within a period of one month. So, make note of all the period which I will mention in this article which will be asked in the prelims question. Next, it can be extended to indefinite period only with the approval of parliament. Here, you have to be clear that with the approval of parliament, you can extend the national emergency up to a period of six months. With further approval from the parliament, it can be extended to an indefinite period. Make sure you are clear with the differences here. So, with the declaration of national emergency, it leads to the suspension of the article 19. So, article 19 gives the freedom of speech and expression. So, with the declaration of national emergency, the article 19 will be suspended. Make note that article 20 and 21, which is the protection of conviction of offences and the right to life and personal liberty, both these articles cannot be suspended during the national emergency. So, also during the period of national emergency, the central government will take control of the state government and they can, the parliament can legislate laws in the state subjects also. So, these are the important points that you have to remember regarding the national emergency. Now, we will see about the state emergency or the president's rule which comes under the article 356. So, the ground for declaration of president rule is the breakdown of constitutional machinery. So, if the president is convinced that the state government is not able to conduct their government based on the provisions of the constitution, president can declare the state emergency. So, he will declare the emergency based on the report of the governor or the approval of the parliament. So, here in case of state emergency, the parliament has to give approval within a period of two months. So, here in case of national emergency, we saw the period was one month, but here it is two months. So, in case of state emergency also, it can be extended to a period of six months and in case of special circumstances, it can be extended to a period of three months. So, with further approval of the parliament, it can be extended to a period of three years. So, during the president's rule, the executive functions of the state will be overtaken by the president. 
also during the state emergency the state assembly will be dissolved or suspended here you can see the central government can misuse the power due to the political reasons to keep a check on this the sr bomay case said that the declaration of state emergency is subjected to judicial review by the supreme court so this will keep a check to the misuse of the state emergency so next we have the financial emergency under the article 360 so this financial emergency will be proclaimed by the president if there is a threat or financial stability to the indian economy so the president will declare the financial emergency and it is approved by the parliament within 2 months so in case of national emergency and state emergency we saw a time limit so in national emergency it can be extended up to 6 months and it can be extended to indefinite period with further approval so but in case of financial emergency it is indefinite until the president revokes it so during the financial emergency the salary of the state government employees and the central government employees will be reduced and all the financial bills that will be passed in the state governments has to get the assent of the president so until now there is no financial emergency declared in india so let's revise one by one it is at national emergency article 352 state emergency article 356 and 360 we have seen the grounds for the declaration of the emergency and what is the process we made sure what are the differences of the emergency period and what will be the impact on the state government so now let us see what is the landmark case with respect to the emergency so uh, as already said we have the sr bombay case of the 1994 so this case restricted the misuse of the article 356 they will so this case made sure that the declaration of the state emergency is subjected to the judicial review and the state assembly can be dissolved only with the approval of the parliament they can't be dissolved merely on the grounds of proclamation of the emergency but only with the approval of the parliament they can be dissolved next is the 44th amendment of 1978 so we saw the national emergency is declared on grounds of war external aggression and armed rebellion so before the 44th amendment we had a term called as internal disturbance but this internal disturbance is re replaced with the term armed rebellion so and this amendment also introduced that this has to be approved by both the houses within a period of 1 month so before this 44 amendments the period was 2 months now it has reduced to 1 month also based on this amendment article 20 and 21 cannot be suspended during the period of national emergency so with this knowledge let's see a prelims question which of the following amendments to the constitution of india limited the scope of declaring the national emergency on the grounds of internal disturbances so the correct answer is 44th we already saw this so with this let's conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one look at this news article from the newspaper live mint so this article says the commerce and industrial ministry has launched an initiative called as the bharat startup knowledge access registry so let's see what is this initiative and what is a startup and what are the interventions that are taken by the government to promote the startups from the prelims perspective elaborately so firstly let's start what are the key features of this baskar initiative so this is nothing but the bharat startup knowledge access registry so the main purpose of this initiative is to connect the people so this will provide a digital platform to connect the startup people the investors the mentors and the persons who are providing services and the government bodies so it will provide a digital platform to connect all these stakeholders so and they will collaborate and network which will help them to access the resources so using this baskar initiative they can quickly access the required resources in no time so it is this is given here it is a centralized space for the collaboration resource access and the networking so each person is given with a unique id with which they can interact in a customized way efficiently so they are also providing a powerful search tool which will help them to find the relevant resources and collaborators in short 
time. They can quickly access the opportunities using this digital platform called as the Baskar. The main goal of this initiative is to create a world largest digital registry for the startups. So this will help India to become a global brand. The target in terms of growth is to increase the number of startups to up to 5 lakhs in the upcoming years. They are also planning to increase the number of startups in each district. So by next year, Jan 16, they are planning to create at least one startup in every district of India. So these are the main features of this initiative. So it is a digital platform which will help them to connect. So using this digital platform, they can access the resources and opportunities. So this will help India to become a global brand. So using this initiative, we can increase the number of startups in every district. This is the gist of this initiative. Now, let's see what is a startup in India. Let's start it from the basic. What is a startup? So, a startup in India has to be less than 10 years old and the turnover should not exceed 100 crore in any year. Let's say they exist for about 5 years. In all these 5 years, their turnover should not exceed 100 crores. So, this is an important requirement to become a startup. Also, they have to work towards innovation, development and improvement of products, processes and services. So, if they are creating a business, their scalability should be in such a way that they are able to create many jobs as well as wealth in the Indian economy. So, to become a startup in India, they has to be registered as a private limited company or a partnership firm or a LLP in India. This is also an important criteria to become a startup in India. So, if there is a company and they are splitting up to form two entities. So, these two separate entities can't become a startup in India according to the norms. Also, if an existing business is reconstructed to form another business, they can also not become a startup in India. So, these are the main criteria to become a startup in India. First is they have to be less than 10 years. Next, the turnover should not exceed 100 crores in any year. They have to work towards innovation. They have to be registered as private limited company and this they can't be formed by a split up or the reconstruction. These are the gist of the criteria which are required to be a startup in India. Now, let us see what is the contribution of these startups to the Indian economy. First is the employment generation. The startups have the ability to create employment efficiently. So, this can be witnessed that according to the, so as of 2023, almost 6.5 lakh jobs were created in by these startups. Next, we have the economic growth. So, the startups are the key drivers of the innovation and the entrepreneurship in India. So, they can significantly contribute to the Indian GDP. So, the startups has attracted almost 140 billion dollars over the past decade. So, this shows that all the countries in the world are having a conference in the startup ecosystem of India. So, this funding of about 140 billion shows this confidence. Next is India is home to almost 100 plus unicorns in the world. Unicorns are nothing but a startup which is having a value of more than 1 billion dollars. So, with this, India is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. So, these are some important data regarding these startups. So, they are creating a job of about 6.5 lakhs. They are contributing efficiently to the GDP. They have attracted fund of about 140 billion and there are almost 100 plus unicorns in India and India is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. So, now we will see what are some similar initiatives in India like the Baskar initiative. First is the Startup India Mission. So, this initiative was started in the year 2016. So, based on this initiative, the government of India is offering a tax exemption and supporting by funding. 
they have also simplified the regulation which has increased the number of startups in india so under the startup india mission they can also get access to the mentors and incubators incubators are nothing but it is a space which will support and develop the entrepreneurs in india next is the atal innovation mission so it is an initiative by the niti ayo national institution for the transformation of india so under this atal innovation mission atal thinking labs are established also with that they are providing grant to the incubation centers thirdly we have the fund of fund startups so this startup funds is set up by the sibbi which is the small industries development bank of india so this fund of fund is under the startup india mission and they will provide the fund through the venture capital and the private equity funds lastly we have the national initiative for the developing and harnessing the innovation so this is launched by the department of science and technology and they will support the startups in the technology sector with the support of financial as well as mentoring these are some important initiatives to promote the startup in india first is the startup india mission next we have the atal innovation mission next we have the fund of fund mission and lastly we have the national initiative for developing and harnessing the innovation so with this knowledge let's see a prelims practice question which of the following statement is true about the fund of funds for the startups we have already seen this fund of funds is set up by the sibbi under the startup india mission so the answer is option c it is administered by the sibbi to provide the funding support through the venture capital funds so here the funding is provided through the venture capital and not directly to the startups with this let's conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one look at this first news article taken from the newspaper indian express government of india is planning to allocate almost 6000 crores to promote the precision farming in horticulture so this promotion is done under the program called as smart precision horticulture program so this program is aiming to cover almost 15000 acres in the next 5 years which will benefit almost 60000 farmers in india so precision farming is nothing but the use of advanced technologies to increase the productivity of the horticulture and other farming by reducing the environmental impact so this will help the farmers to deal with the climate stress so now let's try to understand what is horticulture and precision farming from the prelims perspective horticulture is nothing but it is the science of cultivation or the growing of fruits vegetables flowers and the ornamental plants so the growing of all these products is called as the horticulture so the main aim of the horticulture is to improve the plant growth which is the increase in the size of the and the length of the plant next is the improve the yield of the plant yield is the not, yield is nothing but the amount of crop or produce which is harvested in a specific area so this horticulture is also aiming to increase the quality and the resistance of the plant against the diseases so this involves practice of traditional techniques such as the soil management soil management is nothing but we are going to use techniques which will improve the soil quality for example we have the crop rotation if same crop is cultivated again and again the quality of the soil will reduce if you are using alternative crops on the subsequent period the nutrients will replenish which will help to enhance the soil quality next is the irrigation and pruning pruning is a technique in which we are going to cut off the dead end of the plants it also involves cutting off overgrown branch in this way it will help to maintain the shape of the plant also to increase the productivity of the fruit or the vegetable which we are going to cultivate next is the process called grafting so in this process we are going to take two plants and the stem of one plant is cut off and taken and the similarly another part is taken from the another plant and we are going to combine both these stems so this will help us to combine the strength of both these plants and cultivate so this technique is called as the 
grafting which is used in the horticulture process. Next is the, the horticulture is going to give a primary focus on the high value crops. Similarly, you have to note that horticulture is going to rely on the higher amount of inputs such as the fertilizer and the pesticides. So, this can lead to environmental stress if it is not practiced sustainably. So, that is why a special focus is given to the organic farming in which the pesticides are replaced with the organic manures. Next, we have the zero residue production and the creating centers for excellence and the innovation which will help us to innovate new techniques to reduce the impact on the environment. So, with this basics, let us move to the mission for integrated development of horticulture. So, in the article, we mentioned about the smart mission for the horticulture program. So, this program is coming under a mission called as the integrated development of horticulture. So, this mission was launched in the year 2014 under a ministry known as agriculture and farmers welfare. So, whenever you are going to read any mission or a program, please understand under what ministry they come. So, this might pop up in the UPSC prelims question. So, the main aim of this horticulture program is to promote the development of horticulture. So, this include the increasing the productivity of the crop, production of the crop, yield and enhancing the market availability of the crop. These are the main focus area of this integrated development of horticulture. The key components of this mission is the first we are going to talk about the center of excellence. So, up to date almost 32 center of excellence has been established. Under this mission they are going to establish 100 center of excellence in the upcoming next 5 years. And next we have the agriculture infrastructure fund. So, those who adopt new technology, loans are given with 3% interest subvention to promote their adoption of technology in the horticulture. Next, we have the precision farming development centers. So, almost 22 centers will be established in the future to adapt the technologies according to the local requirements. So, under the mission for integrated development of horticulture, these are the 5 sub-schemes. First is the National Horticulture Mission. Next, Horticulture Mission for the Northeast and the Himalayan states. So, this is specifically for the states in the Northeast and the Himalayan region. Next, we have the National Horticulture Board, Coconut Development Board and the Central Institute of Horticulture. These are the sub-compartments under this mission. Now, let us see what are the main activities conducted under this mission. First is the area expansion under the horticulture. So, they are going to expand the area which is under the horticulture. They are also aiming to provide quality seeds to the farmers. We know that one of the main concern regarding the agriculture is the post harvest losses. So, they are going to develop the infrastructure to reduce this loss such as the development of cold storage. Under this mission training is also given in the modern techniques to improve their efficiency. So, this mission is also linked with other schemes such as the Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana Pradhan Mandri Krishi Sinchai Yojana and the National Food Security Mission. So, the, in this news article, the main focus was the precision farming. So, let us see what is precision farming. Usually, while practicing agriculture, the farmers tend to apply abundant amount of inputs. So, this can cause environmental problems. But if we are replacing this abundant amount with an exact and precise amount of inputs, this can reduce the environmental impact. This is the basic concept of the precision farming. So, under this precision farming, we are going to use modern technologies such as the artificial intelligence, drones, internet of things and GPS to optimize the farm inputs. For example, we are going to use the GPS to apply appropriate and the accurate amount of inputs to the crops. Let us say we are going to apply the fertilizer. We are going to use the GPS and apply accurate amount of fertilizer directly to the root of this plant. So, this will reduce the environmental impact and at the same time it will also improve the productivity of the crop. Next, it is aiming to enhance the efficiency, yield and reduce the environmental impact as already said. 
So, precision farming is not only subjected to horticulture, we can also apply it in case of animal husbandry and the agronomy. It also improves the quality and the quantity of the produce by minimizing the environmental stress because we are going to apply exact amount of input which is required. Another advantage is that it is applicable in large scale agriculture field also. So, in this discussion we saw what is horticulture and what is the mission for integrated development of the horticulture? We saw what is precision farming and its advantage. With this, let us see prelims question. The National Horticulture Mission, a sub-scheme under the mission for integrated development of horticulture, primarily aims to which of the following? The correct answer is B. It will enhance the production and productivity of high value horticulture crops. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this article. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedbacks as comment and do not forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.